The Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Florida Beer Podcast powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. This is Dave, your host and author. I am excited about today's episode because we are going to be heading towards North Florida for a little bit, which is awesome. But before we get there, it is basically festival season yet again. I mean, it's always festival season, let's be honest with you. But for some reason, there seem to be many more beer festivals in the fall and winter here in Florida than in the spring and summer for obvious reasons. Now, we have a number of festivals that are coming up. I do know for a fact that North Miami brew fest will be coming back to North Miami in a new location, which is awesome. Uh, Stormhouse brewing in North Palm beach is going to be having another beer festival coming up pretty soon in December. And from what I've heard, there's some other festivals that are going to be returning for a second year. Um, that hasn't been released just yet, but I will definitely let you know when those come out. We do have a couple of festivals that are coming up relatively soon. And first and foremost is Orlando Beer Festival. That is the eighth annual Orlando Beer Festival on November 4th, which is a Saturday in Festival Park in the Milk District of Orlando. And if you know anything about the Milk District, you know exactly where that is. And if you don't know anything about the Milk District, well, it's worth a Google because it is a surprisingly dairy forward portion of Orlando's history. Advanced tickets are $55 right now. It is going to go up. The closer we get to the event, you're going to have over 200 varieties of beers with some absolutely fantastic breweries that are going to be there at the event, including people like three daughters, Ivanhoe park, Funky Buddha, Walking Tree, Persimmon Hollow, uh, 12 Talons, which just opened, Central 28, Windermere Brewing, just a lot of really, really great people are going to be at that event. Definitely recommend that you go check that out if you are in the City Beautiful on November 4th. The next one that we have is, since it is October... It is time for Oktoberfest and possibly the best Oktoberfest that I have ever been to was at the American German Club of the Palm Beaches. If you remember, we did do a live episode of the Florida Beer Podcast from the American German Club during Oktoberfest. Uh, You can find the link to that in our show notes. And Oktoberfest is back. And Oktoberfest is basically two weekends, uh, October 13th through the 15th. That's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then the next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, October 20th through the 22nd. Um, the tickets for that are going to start at about $10. And then obviously it's pay as you go. Uh, the beer is fantastic. The food is fantastic. The entertainment is fantastic and authentic. I do believe they fly them in from Germany. Also got rides shopping just it's it's a great event i had an absolute blast i'm hoping i will be able to get back there again this year and if you want a little bit more understanding kind of vision as to what the event is going to be like like i said recommend that you check us out at the florida beer podcast finally on october 14th which is Saturday. There's a lot going on on October 14th. Um, That is going to be the return of the Treasure Coast Wine and Ale Trail Festival. This is held at Summer Crush Winery in Fort Pierce. And I'm very excited to, to get back to that one. We will be at the Treasure Coast Wine and Ale Trail Festival this year. Um, It's actually kind of fun because tickets are $30. 
But if you stay with one of the partner hotels during the weekend, you will get two free tickets to the event. And that's a great, great thing to do. Uh, We stayed at a hotel afterward that night. Uh, We will be staying at a partner hotel this year and it's just a fantastic place to do it so you've got plenty of hotels that are in the area including you know such as the holiday inn express and suites which is right on okeechobee road if you've never been to fort pierce it's a great hotel that is situated literally between the turnpike and 95 it is centrally located to literally everything that you need got a couple of hotels that are in port st Lucie, such as residence inn got a couple that are in jensen beach such as hutchinson shores and obviously you've got some that are in fort pierce like the holiday inn express and suites um, they will each have a promo code that you will need to use to book and the best place to do that is to head to the festival's website at tcwineandaletrail.com forward slash festival. That link is going to be in our show notes, along with interviews from representatives of each of the three Florida counties that are represented in the Treasure Coast Wine and Ale Trail, obviously being St. Lucie County, Indian River County, and Martin County. St. Lucie County is obviously the host because that's where Fort Pierce is. The link to that episode is in our show notes. We will be there as well. We will be doing some more interviewing. So if you see me walking around with all my equipment, I'll be the instantly recognizable guy with the headphones and the microphone on, but definitely check out the festival. Like I said, it's $30. Or if you do stay at one of the partner hotels, such as my absolute favorite, that Holiday Inn Express and Suites in Fort Pierce, it's they're centrally located and they're absolutely fantastic. And it's a short drive to downtown Fort Pierce where you've got Sailfish Brewing and a number of other great restaurants available for a good meal after the event is over. Like I said, links to all of these festivals and links to the podcast episodes that we did at Treasure Coast Wine and Ale Trail and American German Club of the Palm Beaches, they're all in our show notes as well. The other thing that you're going to find in our show notes is a link to hiatus brewing hiatus will not be represented at any of these. Unfortunately, uh, the nearest festival that they're going to get to is Hogtown in Gainesville because hiatus is in Ocala. And I am very happy to have finally started to drive North and listen to some of the brewers that we have in North central Florida, talk about their particular breweries. Hiatus has been around for a few years and it's kind of interesting because they did take a very tropical, almost Mexican sort of approach to the vision of their brewery. It's obviously not Mexican, but you, you'll get what I say when you actually get there. And so we're going to be speaking to co-founder and brewer, Lucas Frank. He is a brewer. He is obviously the co-owner along with his wife. And if you take a look by the bar, you will see a picture of the two of them and their three daughters. I love the fact that the family photo is up in such a, such an obvious location. Uh, so we're going to be talking to him about opening a brewery in Ocala, moving to Ocala to begin with how he kind of found himself in Marion County and a lot of the things that he's been able to do. And a lot of the awards that he's been able to win with some of the absolutely phenomenal beers that Lucas has on tap. So once you have your tickets for all these events, sit down, enjoy listening to Lucas Frank, the co-owner and brewer at hiatus brewing. When it comes to the business that we are currently sitting in and because it was you and your wife that created this and opened it, who started that conversation first? Cause this is not like going out to the store and deciding to purchase a shed for the backyard. It's significantly more complicated than that. Yeah. For, for me kind of in, initiated the, the conversation about doing something in 2015. And then I don't know, was that like, I would say maybe two months after that I found out my wife was pregnant with our third child. So then it got put back on the, on the back burner, but it was initiated by me we both worked in healthcare and just uh, things weren't going well in terms of the way that industry was shaping up and kind of saw the writing on the wall and 
I said, I think it's time for, for me to make a change. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with us both being in the same industry with what's potentially coming down. So in 2017, took a, a small business uh, incubator class at the uh, local uh, SBA or SBDC, excuse me, um, and it just kind of cut my teeth on what to do. And then once you sat through that incubator, you got paired up with uh, a specialist there and they worked with me every step of the way to the point where we when we opened. So it was a really good program. I was very green in terms of business. I had worked in restaurants before when I was a kid, but not since I was 21. And I was going to say, this uh, this is a brew pub, obviously. In the restaurant aspect, you would probably have some connect, you know, some involvement and visibility into. Mm -hmm. But the beer brewing business side of things were very, very different. How much was your, I guess, mentor able to help you through that part? Or was it sort of a jumping in together? Really, with going with the SBDC, it was more trying to work on the business plan, communication with banks, and basically the, the you know I would say the licensing process. And then I did lean on friends that were in the brewing industry. Peter, who was the former owner of Tomoka, he used to live in the area, and I was friends with him. And we'd always you know shoot text messages back and forth in terms of you know cost of goods, like what's our what's our goals, what's our targets you know, what to look out for and, you know, what to pursue and avoid. Also another local restaurant tour is now working for the Riley Arts Center. He was involved with many restaurants here and helped put our initial food menu together. So I had had contacts just to kind of lean on them and bend their ear in terms of trying to get things operational. Um, but beer wise, it was just more the, the business side of things, trying to figure it out. But when it came to the actual making the liquid and whatnot, I felt fairly confident uh, in going down that path. Now that, that was, uh, I would say a little bit of kind of ignorance on my part, because, you know, once you get in there and you're like, you realize, and even as a home brewer for like 10 years, you, you never have it figured out. Like we've been here now almost four years and I'm still changing the process on, you know, even just the way we hopped our IPAs have just changed that up within the last three or four months. So, you know, information keeps coming out and we keep learning about things. And, and maybe that's kind of what draws me to the process is because you never, you never hit the finish line. It's just always a, a progression in my opinion, or at least in my experience. Absolutely. And why Ocala? Was Ocala always a part of the plan? Because there are some breweries here. I would see, I guess, why Ocala? So uh, I'm originally from the state of Iowa. I moved down here in 2004, just seeking a change. And I was working in healthcare then. So I, I just put out feelers, uh, basically a, a headhunter, lined me up with interviews like every week and not from a small town, but not, you know, 30,000 people, but just pretty good sized town for Iowa. But, you know, obviously not down here. But uh, when, when looking at Ocala kind of fit what I was accustomed to at that time, now granted Ocala's, you know, kind of grown quite a bit in the last 20 years. But uh, I just, I just, I do like the town. I like the community. Uh, so the reason for for being here was is, was was because of that. And just originally finding a job. And but in terms of setting up the brewery, it was just because it was the town I was in. A little bit of thought went into location wise in Ocala. You know, obviously, I didn't want to be downtown because there was two breweries that were already down there. I didn't think there was a problem that needed to be solved. My wife and I live on the west side of town familiar with the area, kind of know what we're getting into and doing your, you know, Esri circle studies and all that and looking at, you know, annual household income, population growth, blah, 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 within a five and 10 mile radius based on our location where we're at, like going for the, in the, in the future was going to be an ideal spot for us, you know, and to be able to have frontage access on 200 where you got 50,000 cars going east and west every day, you know, the, the visibility there and also the access to it. So that was the interesting thing about this location was it, it didn't even exist. I was so frustrated because we couldn't find anything like uh, in retail space, you know, either was very not up to what we were looking for or the cost per square foot was so outrageous that you know, it was going to put you way over, you know, what your, your cost should be for rent. So I just went on the internet on golly, what's the real estate? The real estate more for homes. No, it's it's yeah. it's real estate. It's commercial real estate. Gotcha. It'll come to me anyways. Don't want to plug them, but <laughs> <laughs> they'll be at the next ad spot. But just searched and this showed up, you know. And I just sent the the realtor for this. I said, hey, this is what I want to do. Does the landlord have any interest? And within like two days, we we're you know signed a letter of agreement and. And this was just a pad site. It wasn't even built out. I was going to say, it looks like you are the first tenant in what is a very nice, very lucrative corner spot 
of a small, I, I wouldn't call it a strip mall, obviously. Building. Right. It was, you know, and the, and the good thing is when the, some of the businesses have changed since we've been here, but most of them operate on eight to five. So like, you know, we got 40 parking spots. So in the evening time, you know, how many places say that they got 40 parking spots available? And that was, you know, a huge draw. So there's just many, many positives. The landlord was was just very easy to work with compared to a lot of the other places that I was meeting along the way. And that was what was leading to that frustration. It was just like, like it, it feels like you're trying to force a, a square peg into a round hole with these conversations. And then everybody's like, hey, let's hurry up and sign the lease. I'm like, I don't even know what the build out's going to be. I don't know what your electric is, code. So that was one of the cool things about coming here. We didn't have to bust up the floors or anything like that. We put everything in, they poured it, and, and we were good to go. Yeah, you're kind of lucky in that you got to basically design what your floors yeah, need to look it, like it, as they're getting very, built. Very much so, yes. That was definitely, uh, it also helped to mitigate costs too, you know, because if, you know, you don't have to go and bust things up and, you know, another ten dollars or $20,000 to get all that put into place on top of what you were doing to begin with. So... Now, was it always meant to be a brew pub or was one brought in first and then the other part of it came around so eventually? The layout now is the original original plan. Having the restaurant component was always going to be a part. I, I didn't want it, but you know everything was indicating in terms of doing the research and whatnot from a business standpoint that if you have the food component, it increases your length of stay by about 50 to 60 minutes. Whereas if you didn't have the food component, somebody may come in and have a pint and go somewhere else. And also looking into our location, you know, people aren't going to be out here hopping from one establishment to the other because there aren't any other real establishments. And within the, if you do, it's going to be a good five, 10 minute drive to get somewhere else. So taking that into consideration, you, you know, if people came here, you knew that they were going to be here for a while. And that's what we tried to make sure happen. It basically makes it more of a destination. Than exactly. Less of a- and that was something that we said all along. And, and based off of our, our, off of our food, it's, it's quick quick ticket times, you know, nothing, but it is good food. I, I'll stand behind everything on that menu, but also kind of taking into consideration that we knew we were going to kind of be p- potentially people's before and after. So like if somebody's going to a movie, they'll stop by, or if they're going to the Rainbow Springs or whatever, you know, that they was going to do something before or after. Or even like we get a good bunch of people that, you know, coming off the weekend, they'll go ride Santos uh, on the bike trails out there. So, or You'd be, it'd be difficult to go a day without seeing a car that's got some kayak strapped to the top of it or bikes on the back of it is what I'm saying. And that was, you know, just kind of knowing what we were and what we were going to be and, and just try to hone in on that. Awesome. With the menus, both the food menu and the beer menu, obviously you've got a great location. You know that the people are going to be here, but obviously people have sort of a cultural uh, bias and difference. Did you develop and then refine based on what was being told to you? Or did you try to do enough research into what the local market was going to be so that way you knew what you were going to have when you opened the doors it was going to be something that was going to hit in Ocala, Marion County? Yeah. So when we we first opened, I was just kind of, I was just being trusting in, in Adam who helped put that food menu together. And for the most part, I was, I was happy with it. There's still some of the original menu items on there. But a few of them we quickly abandoned just because the capabilities of our kitchen were inadequate. We weren't able to do it in, in a decent ticket time. So we had to pivot. We didn't have any flatbreads available on there. And there was, you know, it was, we're at a, a restaurant chain up in Gainesville and it was kind of like, it was set up like almost like your, your macro sub sandwich chains, except they did flatbreads that way. And you were, you were getting a flatbread in and out within, within 10 minutes and it was a gourmet looking flat. So I was like, that's something that we can emulate here because, because of the ticket time, but also you weren't selling somebody, you know, a jumbo pizza that was feeding four people for 20 bucks. You know, that's, and then you only got like a $5 PPA. That's, that's not, that's not good, but that's not uh, going to set you up for the longevity there in terms of revenues. So tried to find more along the lines of an individual size flatbread that wasn't too filling, but was, was enough size to where a person would be like, Oh, I wish I had another one. And then maybe leave enough for somebody to try to get an appetizer or, you know, if they didn't fill up on the, on the bread or whatever, that they can get another beer. So in terms of strategy and what we put on the menu, I was a little hesitant to have hot dogs on there. I'm not a real huge fan of hot dogs, but you know, again, trusting Adam and and he put some uh, nothing, nothing too crazy on there. But like I, I that was kind of another of those like I'd say like a, a problem in the area. I didn't know people were actually looking for hot dogs, but apparently they were. You know, because nobody's got them in town. You know, there's no 
I, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't expect it. It was just one of those things, you know? So I'm just like, here we are flying through hot dogs and I just, it's not something I would actively seek out, but they're, they're really good. And I, people were looking for hot dogs. And then, you know, the, just the biggest thing on the food is just like anybody else, it, having to go through your, your cost of goods with, you know, how expensive stuff is. And then just be cognizant of that and what you put on the menu. And I was going to say, cause you've got a very sizable, very delicious looking flatbread menu, but I can see how a lot of some of the items for other menu, other dishes can be sort of repurposed, slightly tweaked. So you only have maybe one or two flatbreads and have maybe one or two special ingredients just for that. Correct. You just try to use what you got and put it across the board, but just make sure that it's unique enough that it stands out, that it doesn't feel like you're, you're kind of diluting the food menu. Exactly. Beer menu, same question, because obviously taking a look at it, and there's some beers on here that may not be on the menu by the time this episode comes out. So if you're listening and you want something that I'm about to talk about, I apologize. But it does seem very focused on the lagers, on the lighter end, maybe not as hoppy. Doesn't mean that you don't have any good, strong IPAs on there, because I know we spoke about that earlier before we started recording, but it seems that is more what the menu reflects. Is that a reflection of where we are? It is an absolute reflection of our market. Basically, just making what everybody wants. You know, so if you look at your sales, you know, and what's moving and what's continuing to push through, and then I, I can keep rebrewing it, make sure the beer is not sitting there for you know extended periods of time, and that's where we've ended up. And you know, just with the top three sellers being lagers, but a few other beers that we've moved in that we kind of rotated in and out, like our American Blonde in the Sun, that's been doing well enough to where it's just kind of stayed on. And then the recent IPA that we, or excuse me, Pale Ale, the Pine Tar that we did with the Florida Grown Cascade, you know, that's been well received and it's continued to move. So now I'm just kind of, you know, it's, how do you want to say this? It's like you got, you know, six kids and you want to make sure everybody's fed and happy, but but, you know, some of those brands may have to get pulled for a while, especially if we're coming in on Oktoberfest style. So we go pretty heavy on German style beers. And you, don't, you don't have one of the larger brew systems I've ever seen either. So. No. Yeah. So we operate on a three barrel. We brew twice a week. Yeah, that's and we do a little bit of distribution in that as well. So it's, you know, for me being currently the only one in charge of all brewing operations, it does get to be a little bit of a grind. But, you know, the good thing is, is doing it for four years. We did have an assistant. His first name is Dan, but he went on to pursue other opportunities and had worked for the larger brewery up in Gainesville. But, you know, with him being here, showed me to be a lot more efficient because I was still kind of operating as, you know, almost like a home brewer. And then seeing how he would do things, it made me way more efficient to where I can, you know, I just, just knocking things out and being able to get out at a reasonable time. Whereas when we first started, you know, I was chilling out, you know, into the fermenter by like eight or nine o'clock at night, you know, 12 hour day. So, you know, it was in a good place right now, at least from a brewing standpoint. And I find that interesting, especially with the number of lagers that you have. And you sort of mentioned this a little bit, kind of going big with the German lagers, especially as it coming up, because you do have a, your Kolsch that won silver at Best Florida Beer last year. And then the other one that I was interested in is, is uh, Hoyse Baby, which is, I guess, a slightly different version combining a Vienna and a Merzen. Yeah. Marathon not being a style that you generally see on Florida taps when it's not September or October. So, you know, and, and to build on that a little bit more, well, let's, let's go on, on the Oise, baby. I've always wanted to try to do like a Latin style lager or a Mexican lager, but in the sense of doing, you know, like the macros, it's going to be no different than what our pay time off is. Like what's the variation going to be there? And we've, and our time stand still, our Amber always moves well. So I, I came across an article somewhere talking about, the, you know, that was their style of, of Mexican lager, Latin lager. And I, I like the idea because for me with them adding the avocado honey in there, it felt authentic. It felt like, okay, this is something different than rather just throwing in some, some corn and some two row and using, you know, a Mexican lager yeast strain. So that's what we went with. I was really happy with the way it turned out. It's got the nice little floral finish on that from the avocado honey. It's got a unique finish. My only concern is with that beer is that it's kind of similar in terms of color to our time stand still, the amber. So I'm going to do it again next year, but we'll we'll darken it up a little bit just so there's a little bit of color contrast. Probably won't do much in the way of flavor change, but at least appearance wise, because, you know, we we eat and drink with our eyes. So yeah. the perception there, but kind of going on that Marizan thing, we did we did one last spring and we named it going to be May. 
you know, kind of a pun. Now there's, I think there's other beers out there that use that name if I'm not mistaken, but we absolutely flew through that through, you know, April and and May. It was, it was crazy. Actually, I I think we only had it in the month of May for like a week and we ran out of it that fast. So kind of, kind of bombed on the name there a little bit, but you know, that's one of the cool things you know, I was thinking about it. Well, why can't we have this beer in springtime? You know, like you were alluding to, like, you know, it's kind of odd to see that, but like, I just, thought it would sound like a good idea and it, and it did it moved really well absolutely i've always been curious about this because we are fairly close to gainesville but ocala seems to have a concentration as well you mentioned there are a few brew pubs that are downtown and obviously infinite is relatively large does the ocala beer scene stand on its own is it considered to be sort of the Ex, the I guess the outskirts slash suburbs of the Gainesville beer scene. I I think there is, you know, the what I find kind of a challenge as being the owner of this is that we're in a county that's got, you know, 350,000, you know, plus people. I, I think based off the last census, I don't know where it's at now, but it's still a challenge because for me and, and what I've noticed in living here, it's still very heavily on the American light loggers. Uh, and, but also we, a lot of competition with spirits too, you know, so I've noticed that has been a big, big push in the craft beer industry. Like all of a sudden, some of the bigger players, they're bringing, they're creating craft spirit lines. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a pivot on, on, on their part. And, it, and you see a lot of it. And I think it's also kind of the, you know, what happened a year or two ago with the explosion of the seltzers, you know, now that's starting to, you know, some of those brands are falling on hard times. But now it's just a transition to spirits and they're ready to drinks. Yeah. I think I think it's a good pivot because you, you have all of the equipment really to do it in, in terms of if you, you know, if you if you do contract distilling, you bring in the spirit and you just do the blending yourself or something like that and package it up and boom, you're out the door. You know, and I think it's I, I think just with trying to be more you know, from a business sense, it makes sense to do that. A business standpoint, it makes sense because you, your diversity and then what it is, is you're not leaving, I guess, when the, when the customer comes in the door, every single option is being checked, you know, okay, wine, seltzer, cocktails, beer, et cetera. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think, I think those that are, are transitioning into that are, are going to be ahead of the curve. But just like anything else, everybody in the industry is getting into the the canned cocktails. You know, now I think you got Jim Bean, Jack Daniels, and all of them have have started to partner up with either what is some of the, I think Jim Bean partner up with Sam Adams, if I'm not mistaken, a Boston Beer Company. I think there's something going on there. I mean, you got PepsiCo doing the Hard Mountain Dew, and I think that's tied in with Sam's as but well. It also comes down to a lot of the you know when you're a brewery, you're a one trick pony. If you have a you know a group of six or eight people, they might not all drink beer. You might need some wine. You might need some harder liquors. You might need some mixed drinks. Correct. You the the goal of any business is to solve problems. You got to cast as wide a net as possible. You know, so that way you can be everything to everyone. Now that's obviously you know very difficult to do, but at least attempt to do that. And and we had had kind of our our wine based cocktails that we opened up with. The problem is, is just, you know, if we're, we're running one or two servers or bartenders or whatever, it's hard to build a drink and then pour and then run the field, food and clear the tables. And, and just to build those, it was just, it just wasn't very efficient. Plus they were, they were okay. They weren't great, but it was enough to try to satisfy. And then we brought on some other ready to drink canned cocktails, but the, the price point was too high on them. You know I mean? They're almost like doubles, but you know, you, you got it's hard to tell somebody that like, Hey, this, this eight ounce can is going to cost you 10 bucks. You know, because that's, you know, in terms of maintaining your margin levels, that's what it needed to be at. But yeah, I, I, I wish I, I had the time and the capability to dedicate to it. But for me, and this kind of goes back to the menu, uh, the, the draft list and what you were saying earlier, Dave, is that is everything's kind of light and breezy. I'm, I'm not a huge fan. And, and we had this conversation off record where, you know, I prefer lower ABV and, and more volume. And, and that, that a little bit of my preference kind of does carry over into the draft list. A lot of people ask for strong beers. I typically don't make them. We do our anniversary beer, which is a dark Belgian strong, usually anywhere between 10 and 12%. Just depends on how it shakes out. We put that on our anniversary. And I may do some 9% stouts, but for the most part, I, I prefer not to go any higher than seven and a half. And, and two reasons. One, responsibility, but also two, in terms of you know volume and sales, it's easier to sell you know three four point two beers and, and feel comfortable about it instead of selling 
three, nine and a half percent. And, 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 you know, and then the responsibility that goes along with it. And that's just my, my personal take on that. And I think a lot of people in the craft beer industry, both consumers and brewers are starting to finally swing back that way. I think the era of having a tap list full of 10 percenters is kind of finally going by the wayside because of a lot of the things that you've just mentioned and more. Yeah. Go, I've also noticed a lot of breweries taking the show us your Uber receipt for coming here and we'll give you 10% off your bill or $2 off your beer. Yeah. Cause they know like funky Buddha's 10th, 10th anniversary. They had heavy hitters on that menu. Like, like their smallest stout was like 12%. And they even said, show us your Uber receipt. We'll give you 10% off. Show us your lift ticket. Show us something that says you're not driving home tonight. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's a cool thing about being in the larger market, that, that capability there now to, to try and do that here and to see if Lyft or Uber is going to be able to, you know, you may only have four or five cars running. It's been a minute since I've checked on that, but I know that, uh, you know, that, that type of transportation is a challenge for, for where we're at. But, but yeah, that was the, kind of the goal there is just to make sure it's just light and breezy. And, and that's also kind of the avoidance of of doing the the higher abv like liquor and and and, and spirits and whatnot cocktails because it, it just makes me nervous i get scared i really do yeah, absolutely and i kind of want to go back to the you know ocala for a little bit because obviously this is new construction you are not the first beer producer in the city how was the city to work with is that point is our is ocala at a point to where they understand what the craft beer industry can do on many different levels. Well, well the good thing on that is, you know, for from our standpoint, I, we only had to deal with one municipality, and that was Marion County. So Ocala okay. ends right here at Airport Road. Really? So we're, we're I don't know, 500 feet from Ocala. <laughs> so we didn't have to do anything with them. I will say this in talking to the other breweries downtown, Infinite and, and Big Hammock, you know, when we were starting out, just seeing what they ran into in terms of issues with the city. And there really wasn't much. Now, I would say with Infinite, it was they were kind of ahead of the curve in terms of getting in. So really nobody else knew. I, I knew Big Hammock ran into some issues in terms of just construction-wise on the inside. But from what I gathered, it wasn't much of a problem. Now, what we ran into with Marion County with, I think at that time, we were the only brewery operational within uh, under Marion County Utilities jurisdiction. So we kind of had to learn each other, you know, in terms of what our, our wastewater program was. They didn't want us just dumping stuff down the drain, which I understand. We kind of went back and forth on the grease trap that was required for this this type of setting. I thought it was excessive. We ended up petitioning in a month before the county commissioners and our, our petition was granted. So smoothed out there, but it was really in dealing with the Marion County Utilities was a little little rough. But, you know, once we figured everybody out and once we were operational, everybody came in and, you know, I showed them I wasn't, you know, there weren't going to be Ninja Turtles jumping out of the sewers or anything like that. You're not uh, taking meth back. Here yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Walter White is no longer here. So, but yeah, that that kind of stuff. And, and But what we do, it, we do have to do something that, that, to my knowledge, nobody else does. So out back, we have two 250-gallon plastic totes that all of our wastewater. So if I'm, I'm getting waste off of the, you know, you know, leftover from the boil, anything out of the fermenter, the bright tank, collect it in a bucket, and I dump it out back. So when they service our grease trap, they'll service those totes as well. So all of our, our wastewater is going out that way. But, you know, I was talking, you know, uh, I reached out to Swamp Head, the Infinite Downtown, and a few others, I'm like, what are you guys doing for, for wastewater? And, so and for area breweries, you've got a pretty good support system around here. Oh, yeah, very much so. Always, always, I will not hesitate to bend somebody's ear on it because that can, you know, an, an ounce of prevention or a pound of cure, uh, you know, try to figure out what you're getting into before you actually go down that path. And, you know, obviously the business is going well. One of the things that I find interesting is that as of this recording, you actually have two beers that are donating towards charity. You've got In the Sun, which is part of the Florida Can Recover project that the uh, Florida Brewers Guild. Thank you so much. You I got don't know why. I could see the logo. That's I could see the logo. <laughs> but that was the beer that they sort of put together to help the victims of Hurricane Irma. That was in, no, it wasn't Irma. No, it was Ian, Ian and thank Nicole, you. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I remember specifically Ian that was in Collier and Lee Counties. But you also have Mission Mustachioed, which is your Stash Strong beer. And I remember Correct. them coming on the Florida Beer Podcast a couple of years ago. I guess why 
you know, most breweries at most, they will have one at any given time. And here we are with two. Why was that aspect of the brewing community so important to you? I think, you know, from a personal standpoint, you just, you just try to do right. You know, just from my experience and, and personal decisions or whatever, I, whatever we try to do charity related wise tries to, you know, benefit the human cause. You know, I've nothing against now we do because of the, the strong ties to the horse community here in this. We do support a, a 5K that benefits. I forget the uh, the specifics on what they do. But in terms of just horse care and stuff like that, they're unable to get whatever they need. But to just try to, to, to try to go towards benefiting, you know, the the human element. And and that was the decision to, to just go down that path to make sure they would try to do more than, you know, maybe other other breweries are doing. Or at least to show that uh, we're, we're trying as much as we can, um, you know. So those those two charities uh, with Stash Strong, we've been with them I, ever since we uh, our first full year, and then with the the Florida Can Recover, that was just uh, another thing. I I like what the program was doing and what their what their attempt was on that, and and just try to contribute as much as we can. We're we're not not big, but we just try to try to assist with with whatever is, is possible. On our scale. Awesome. I guess you've been around for a hot minute. Obviously, you're pretty well established in Ocala and the Marion County in North Central Florida craft beer scene. What do you see as the next couple steps for hiatus? There's about a hundred different things I could probably discuss, but uh, you know, all in various levels of importance. <laughs> you know, really, from our standpoint, is just trying to find not really on premise, but in terms of just some stability with distribution. You know, it's it's tough with the amount of rotation that takes place on on other establishments taps. I, I think the days of you or of breweries just going in and you know trying to tackle already established taps. You know, like say your 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 Bud Miller Coors taps. You know, they're always there. You're not going to get those. You're not going to get in our area, uh, and nothing against uh, Swamp Head, but Big Nose is king in this area. You can go to every establishment, and that beer will be on there, and it's not going to go away. You know, so from our standpoint, like, what do we do to try to differentiate and try to convince other businesses to be like, hey, let's try and carry this brand, and and not only is it just you know potentially just one brand, but like, like, how do you get into like that rotation? And that's something that uh, I've started working on and just from a business standpoint, reaching out to accounts and being like, okay, so what, so it's not really, I think this is the way it's going to be for us going forward is it's not me trying to get a dedicated tab, but it's like, say somebody's rotating in lagers or they're rotating in a Belgian or an IPA is just try to get your beer into that rotation, you know? So you're not going to get that ded- dedicated tap, but at least you know, knowing that you've kind of got your foot in the door. And then, you know, my hopes are just from personal standpoint is that the liquid does well enough that it reaches out to, you know, other people or, or they may not consider bringing in competitors and then maybe dedicating that tap specifically to that brand. And it's, I do, so my goal is to try to get my foot in the door more in, in terms of, of trying to line up with, with rotation that's taking place. So that's distribution wise. The big goal, it took me forever, but we, we had 12 taps forever. So I got 14 on here. Finally, it took like six, seven months to get that in place. I could have done it myself. I just didn't want to. I just did not want to drill holes in the wall. I just didn't feel like doing it. So anyways, we got that, we got that remedy. So that was kind of a goal. But in terms of, you know, long-term, you know, we just, you know, we're, we're four years in with six years remaining on the, on the debt for the business. Things are trending in the right direction, but I think any any big type of changes that take place there are going to be quite a few years down the road. So, I guess if I can just find any way to you know maximize production of what we have right now, that would be the big goal. And and we've done so. I think we're on pace to. I think I think last year we did just a little bit north of 200 barrels, and I think this year we're we're probably estimated to around 240. You know, with our max just doing twice a week is around or just a little bit under 300. So if, if we can get to that point, then, and, 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 you know, proving to my wife, bringing her into the conversation that like, Hey, we've maximized what we can do here. And, and if the numbers make sense, then, then yeah, it could, it could do that. You know, my concern is, as you've seen, 
you know, other breweries, I think that, that overextended in, in recent years and, and in the news and some of them have, you know, you know, closed down or, or pivoted in terms of operations. Yep. And, you know, that's eye opening and you want to just avoid that, you know, no matter how much people tell you or want to be able to fund it, you, you still got to have the numbers that, that support that decision. All right. And let's finish up with kind of the cheesy questions, which I know you have been asked before and you will be asked again. Yes, sir. The name. Oh, the name. The name. So, <laughs> so the goal with what we wanted, and this is between my wife and I, we, we were trying to come up with names, but we kind of had an idea of, of what we wanted it to, you know, represent. And we were just kind of doing like vacation, something along those lines. And it was after our, our daughter's first birthday and we were cleaning up, washing dishes. And my wife was just uh, sitting down for a moment and got the phone out and I think com or whatever. And we're just typing yeah. in words. Uh, and after multiple searches came up with hiatus and I quickly went on to the USPTO and to make sure that there wasn't a trademark of anybody operating in the brewing industry under that name. And there wasn't. So that's that's basically where it went. You know, the definition of hiatus is take a break or a pause from the routine. And that's kind of what the definition of going to a brewery is. Like you come through the door, you leave all the crap outside or whatever you got going on, have a beer. You definitely have that islandy hiatus type of theme going here. And that's exactly one of the things that I wanted to talk about because several years ago, I actually met and chatted with Luke Kemper, the owner, founder of Swamphead. And he specifically mentioned, and you see this, right up and down the top half of Interstate 75, all the breweries here kind of go away from the traditional Florida theme of beaches, beaches, fishing, coastal. It's very, it's very wetlands. It's very forest. It's very old Florida country cracker Springs, culture. Absolutely. Centric. Whereas with hiatus, it's got a very strong coastal vibe, almost Mexican and some of the bright colors that aren't neon slightly muted from that, but still there. It's very much the antithesis of everything that the area has generally used as a theme, but also still very traditional, almost stereotypical Florida. And it's done so beautifully well that it's one of the things that I was very interested Thank in. You. Where was the impetus for that? So and the if you look on the walls for the the larger pictures that we have those are all pictures that my wife and I have taken over the years on various vacations oh, nice i noticed the hawaii picture so the, yes oh, like. so that's kind of our jam and that's kind of what we wanted to convey or, or to bring across especially being inland you know just trying to not feel so landlocked if you will and and that was the the premise on that you know for the for like the chairs and the colors on those that was really done. I'll be honest with you. Anything in here, color scheme wise, was my wife's decision. Gotcha. She was in charge. So at the time, you know, she put this together, like in terms of age demographic and, and and female. I said, if I can get you in here, we can get anybody else in here. And I was just trying to, you know, make sure that we weren't ignoring that. The one thing I I did not want to, and this is not a dig against you know other breweries uh, that have gone with this type of decor, but I just didn't want it to look like there was just you know golden oak stained wood everywhere yeah, you know absolutely. and that's just something that something that that we wanted to avoid so you know going with the you know the whitewash look and color on the chairs it just it kind of fits and tying all the branding together you know even with the with the beer names you know trying to promote a sense of vacation or taking a day off or getting away from you know whatever you got going on that, and that's the motivation again just making sure all of that branding ties together Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Dave. Like I said, Hiatus Brewing really is worth the drive. If you're in the area, please stop in. They've got a full food menu. They've got some phenomenal beers. And Time Stand Still is one of the best beers in the state. And I will very, very readily defend that against anybody that disagrees but if you've disagreed with it, basically you haven't had it yet. It's just that good. Next week is going to be part one of a two-part series with another brewery, this time in Alachua County, part of the Sip and 7 Ale Trail. 
I was very happy that within two days, producer Steve and I were able to connect with all of the breweries and get our swag. Um, if you want to take a look at what the swag looks like, I'm, I'm sure if you scour my Instagram account, you will be able to find those pictures. Instagram and what was Twitter, which is now X and threads. We are at Florida beer blog. Go ahead and give us a like and follow us. If you're on Facebook, it's going to be FL beer blog. That's us. If you want to email us, you can do so at Florida beer blog at gmail.com. Or you can find us on the internet at floridabeerblog.com or floridabeerpodcast.com. We are a proud member of the Florida Podcast Network, which is a big collection of amazing podcasts centered in and created by people here in the Sunshine State. And you can find them at floridapodcastnetwork.com. We do ask that if you are listening to us on a podcasting app, make sure to follow us like us subscribe to us and if you can leave a rating please give us a nice five stars it does help us get the word out and spread the joy about amazing florida beers our intro announcer is jeff brosovich field producer is steve piccola executive producer for the florida podcast network and grand high poobah is jemmy lagagna this is david butler your host and author We will be seeing you back here next week for our next episode. Hopefully we will be seeing you at Treasure Coast Wine and Ale Trail on October 14th in Fort Pierce. And regardless of where we do see you, drink Florida Craft.